I've had the pleasure of having David stay at my house four years ago when he came and did something like this, and then there at my house this time too. So we have had a lot of fun, and I'm so grateful for you guys and for me to have them here tonight. They're such blessings in my life. Thank you. Oh, thank you. We're so glad you came. We're, I'm just so grateful to be back to California. I just love the vibe coming out here to California and, um, and Svava has been wanting to come. We came out here once, I think she got to experience, the, what she got to experience of the entire LA area was Topanga Canyon. <laughs> so that was pretty <laughs> mystical actually, but she's like, I would like to see some water and I would like to go to a beach and different things. So those were whims and we did. We were at the beach today, enjoying everything. So I think I just wanted to welcome everybody and I think it's, we'll start off with a song from Svava to kind of help everybody relax and, and sink inward. And uh, she has received quite a few songs, like over 137, something like that, or something, something like that. And she's received these songs from the Spirit, and then she, yeah, she went on YouTube, she learned how to play the guitar, self-taught, she plays the keyboard uh, for making albums, and then uh, she went into a recording studio, and then she thought, oh, I think I, I could get into mixing and mastering and distribution, and so she's done the whole thing with intuitive guidance. Sometimes they have a comedian like Lily Tomlin does like a one-woman show, and she's had all these songs just come to her and through her, and then she's able to layer her voice like Enya does and use digital electronics, and so I think it's quite amazing uh, what's come through. But you've got a song for us to sink inward. I'm so grateful to be here, Just loving it so much, thank you all for coming, and uh, the song I'm gonna sing is called uh, Eternal, if you know you, I'll sing it. It's kind of hard to hear you. Yeah. Speak up a little. She sings, she sings much louder than she speaks. Yeah. So. Yeah, I should speak a little bit louder yeah, than yeah. like that. <laughs>
dawned on me that um, after I started really tuning, diving into the Course and, and listening to the guidance and hearing Jesus speak to me that, yeah, it's been, when I came, my first trip with Jesus, He guided me out west and this was the, this was the first city in California that I came to, back in 1991, and it started off with the guidance after I'd been immersing in the Course and using it like an oracle and diving in, and then Jesus was just telling me, go west, that's, that's where it started with, go west, it wasn't, a, it was to be a, a journey of undoing preferences, undoing judgments, hi Rich. <laughs> LA, <laughs> he's got his LA hat on. And LA ended up being where I was coming, I came out through uh, I-40, took the southern route. And to me, spirituality and spiritual awakening is about uh, living in joy, living in the present moment, and being in touch with your intuition, the inner guidance, and just following it. And that's it, living in presence, in the moment. And for me, what became initially a study of many different spiritual traditions and spiritual teachers, and a curiosity about spirituality, it turned into a daily life. So for me, when I first picked up A Course in Miracles in 1986, I did have the strong feeling 
that this was to be lived. And I, I really wanted to fully know what it means to live in the present moment. Because all the mystics and saints had talked about living in the present moment. And most spiritual traditions do talk about guidance. There are some non-dual traditions that, that don't emphasize it. It's more of an, an, I'd say, focus on meditation and stillness. But A Course in Miracles says, the Holy Spirit's voice can speak to you all through the day without interrupting your regular activities in any way. To me, that sounded very practical. Speak to me all through the day without interrupting my regular activities in any way. So that was the great experiment was to go on a road trip and the road trip brought me out to LA uh, among other places. Then it took me up to the Bay Area, up to past Seattle, out to Whidbey Island and then across the, the plains, the northern plains. And that was first trip was five and a half weeks. And for me, it was a, an opportunity to listen and follow because that was what I was told when I heard go west. Of course, I was curious, where am I going? And it was like, you will be told all that you need to know on a moment by moment basis. I'm not giving you a plan. Uh, you're undoing. I have a five year degree in urban planning. And Jesus was basically saying, I want you to become so intuitive, I want you to become 100% intuitive, where you don't rely on your past learning for anything. And I think I'm grateful now, looking back to that 32 years ago, because that was the beginning of, of letting go of relying on past learning and becoming guided and just following the guidance. And then, as I went along with it deeper and deeper, I was, I was literally told day by day where to go, where to stay. I had no organizational support. I had no church behind me. I had no money in the bank. I had no, what the world would call, means of support. And after 10 years of university, to be told, go west, uh, I, you can imagine some of the thoughts that I had. <laughs> I heard go west. Where will I stay? Where? How will I eat? How will I put gasoline in the car? All the typical things you would think about as prudent and practical. And basically what I was being taught was Jesus was saying that just listen to my voice and I will tell you where to go, what to do, and I will take care of everything that that doesn't matter. And uh, I was quite curious about that. Like, so let me get this straight. You just want me to show up and be in joy and in purpose, and then you'll take care of all the details. Sounded pretty radical to me. That was nothing that my past learning, uh, 10 years full-time undergraduate and graduate had taught me. It was all about preparing how to handle the world, how to survive, how to have a job, how to have a career, how to build a future, how to carve out your niche in the world and society. So that began a listen-follow experience with guidance that has continued on for the last 32 years. That was pretty radical for me at the time because it was really letting go of, of job, of career, it was letting go of future ambitions, it was letting go of all my goals for this world and life. And I found that that was absolutely essential to fully merge in the present moment, was to be freed up from future goals which were based on past learning, to open to the present moment and that the present moment would always be fresh and clean and new. And it, it started off as, a, as a really a grand experiment. Uh, but after the first trip to LA and the first five and a half weeks, the, it went so well that uh, I thought, well, this is, 
It's amazing. I'm just going to continue with this. And the Course in Miracles is teaching the same thing that all the great deep spiritual traditions teach, which is empty your mind of everything you think you think and think you know, and tune in to your Holy Spirit, to Jesus, to the present moment, and everything will be taken care of. It was pretty radical because in one sense Jesus was saying that, that the guidance would handle everything, and some of you know that line from the Course, trust would settle every problem now. That is definitely an invitation to the present moment. It seems radical from the ego perspective because it's like, what, what possibly could handle every problem now? What could collapse the idea of problems, specific problems, into it, an experience that, that is just everything is perfect and everything is taken care of? So, to me, spirituality really had to be practical and it had to be something that that I could give my heart and soul over to. And then I couldn't even begin to tell you all the experiences <laughs> that have occurred in these, uh, these 32 years. It has been a sense always that, that everything is taken care of and anything that was perceived as a problem was just an opportunity to give it over. And that's what the Course has taught me. Bring your illusions to the truth. Bring your perceptions of lack to the truth. Bring your struggles, your challenges, your pains to the truth. Bring the darkness to the light. Do not attempt to bring the light into the darkness. <laughs> If you do, the ego will persist, because you cannot bring truth to illusions. You can only bring illusions to the truth. So that was a basic tenet that I got from studying and practicing the Course. Always, always, always bring the illusions to the truth. And so, what I've experienced too is that Jesus not only was speaking to me, but he wanted to speak through me, so that's been what's gone on. <laughs> Some of you have followed along. It's been 44 countries and uh, different, many different cultures. Uh, China, so, some amazing experiences there. Some of the parables, at the beginning I said, do I, am I going to have to make up parables and teach parables like you taught 2,000 years ago? It was the Jesus laughing and said, no, you're going to live through so many things that you won't have to make them up. <laughs> like there was a man who had two sons, you know, no, you're going to have such amazing experiences that when you're meeting with somebody and they're struggling with something, one of the teachings, you'll have probably like 10 parables <laughs> that you can tell them and lots of examples and metaphors to help make it more practical for your brothers and sisters. We want it practical. We want it to be practical and meaningful. We don't want ideas sailing over our, our awareness. We want things to meet us where we need it the most. And so that's been the great, great adventure. And, and also it's, it's allowed me to just to kind of just be aware of the world. I, I enjoyed reading books, I enjoyed watching movies, music. Uh, I guess in those 32 years I've had, I don't even know how many singer-songwriters that have appeared because Jesus was saying, yeah, you can talk, but let's complement it with some music. So I've had singer-songwriters, one after the next after the next in different countries and different cultures, translators show up, uh, it's just been amazing. And, and also it's been very practical because it's been able, I've been able to show movies, which I enjoy movies. I think they're the modern day parables, so that's also been something that's been wonderful for me because I like it to be as practical as possible so people can actually start to feel their heart open up, so they can feel 
this love and this connection and this happiness and joy. You know, a lot of times I just will meditate and listen to music, but it's just this, this great joy. So I think the important thing is, is that, that when we look at the teachings of A Course in Miracles, it's teaching that the origin of this linear cosmos and this world is, is the ego. And Jesus says, the world was made in hatred. That is pretty radical. I was raised Christian and I remember reading the first book of the Bible, Genesis, said God created the heavens and the earth. And then Jesus is, is saying, well, it's half right. God created the heavens. <laughs> God created eternity. God is eternity and everything that comes from God is an eternal creation. Spirit creates like itself, but this world is, is temporary by nature. This world is, is, uh, is, is a, an invention of the ego, which the world was made in hatred. And once you start to just begin to take that in, you start to realize, wow, then I don't need to start to think of this world as my home. I actually need to start to pray for help to see beyond this linear world. Beyond, as Jesus says in the, the Course, uh, Lesson 128 is, the world I see holds nothing that I want, and then Lesson 129 is, beyond this world is the world I want. So to me, that became my prayer. I want to, I want to experience the happy dream. I want to experience a world of non-judgment. I want to, to see the world light up. Show me the light. <laughs> Bring me the light as, as I go along. And that's been very, very, very practical for me to, to go through it that way. It's been a joyful journey and, and I have to say it just kind of continues with things that, that drop in and are given over and over. And, and that's part of what brought us here. That's what's brought us here. Do you have a song? Do you like to <laughs> come yeah. in? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Okay.
that I, I was struck with with my practice with the Course was that Jesus says miracles are involuntary and should not be under conscious control. Wow! That is quite amazing because when we think of that word control it seems that there are things that we perceive in the world, in our experiences of being human, that we have had a desire to control. Uh, and we have equated with this desire to control the body and the world with, uh, with intelligence, uh, with success with um, survival. We really believe there are certain things that are good and well to control. And over these last uh, 35, 36 years of, of working with the Course, that's been the, the most beautiful thing is 
is the experience of being able to watch the world with such a state of calmness and stillness and a very deep, deep, strong awareness that, that nothing in the world can be different than it is. Jesus says this in a course where he says, seek not to change the world, seek rather to change your mind about the world. So he's calling us into a perspective. He's just saying, there is a perspective in you that's so holy, and this is the Holy Spirit's perspective. And this, is, sometimes he calls it above the battleground, come above the battleground, or he will give us phrases like, let all things be exactly as they are, or he will say, all things work together for good. There are no exceptions except in the ego's judgment. It's, it's this sense that everything actually is in divine order. Everything that is happening is in divine order. And yet, you can only know its divine order from this higher perspective. So it's like, that's why it's so important to be intuitive. Because the more you practice being intuitive, the more you're taking, you're merging your mind with this higher perspective. And you can see that there's only one way that you could see that all things are working together for good. He, he says, he gives us a clue where he says, without judgment, all things are equally acceptable. So there's the key, without judgment, all things are equally acceptable. This is echoing what Jesus taught 2,000 years ago, when in the Beatitudes and the Sermon on the Mount, he said, judge not, lest you be judged. He's basically saying that if you judge, you are judging yourself. And God didn't create you that way. God didn't give you the ability to judge. That was the ego. That was the ego adding to spirit and saying, well, let's just try some judgment. So in the Course of Miracles, Jesus says, judgment arose uh, as an invention of the ego in order to minimize fear while keeping it. See how sneaky the ego is. Minimize fear while keeping it. So that's, of course, we now we perceive a world of linear time where we have a judicial system, we have uh, prisons, we have rules. Most public places you go, you can either find the written rules for that public place or the unwritten rules <laughs> for that. Sometimes we find out after the fact, what? Where did that rule come from? That's, that's a given. So, so the ego tried to bring stability in what seemed to be a very chaotic um, state of mind, which some traditions have called the fall from grace or the course calls it the separation. Um, living in a state that's, that's not what the Creator created, a state of, of lack, a state of um, need. And, and this state initially was experienced as very chaotic because the mind was used to just wholeness and love and oneness. So the fall in experience from grace, from wholeness into lack, or wholeness into need was extremely chaotic. And then the ego answered that chaos with, I'll invent judgment to minimize the chaos. Sometimes people say, can you give me an example? I say, well, let's say there's like a preschool teacher and she leaves the room for about 20 minutes. And while she's gone, there's a food fight, <laughs> the preschoolers start pulling each other's hair, throwing food, there's food sticking on the ceiling, coming down, and the teacher comes back in the room and goes, stop. <laughs> like, 
Stop, stop, stop. Okay, all you little girls over there, all the little boys over here. And, and the teacher tries to bring some order into the preschool room where it's gone berserk with food and everything like this. That's like the ego trying to come up with an invention to manage fear. And that's what judgment is. It's a, it's a device that was made to manage fear without letting it go. You see how that also preserves the ego, because the ego is fear. So that's what all defenses do, is they protect the ego. In heaven there aren't any defense mechanisms. There's no need for denial or repression or projection. All the things we know from, from psychology, uh, Miriam, being a psychotherapist, she could tell us, oh, there's a list of defense mechanisms <laughs> that she's encountered in all of her counseling sessions over the many, many years, but they all were made by the ego with the purpose of, of protecting itself, of perpetuating the ego, which is really just perpetuating fear. Recently, uh, Olivia Newton-John passed away. And I remember all those songs that I listened to for so many years, that soothing voice. And, and uh, lately on my phone, uh, on one of my playlists, the song just keeps coming and playing over and over and over on the playlist. And the name of the song is Love is Letting Go of Fear. This is the title of Olivia Newton-John's song is the same title of Jerry Jampolsky's book which has been translated to many, many languages all over the world. Love is letting go of fear. And at the end of the song, she has two words that, that are very lengthy, and she says them very present and very slowly. So the whole song she sings, Love is letting go of fear, and then she says, let go. That's her final two words. And as she's just passed away, I, she's been like talking to me. When people pass away, sometimes they come in my mind and they, they keep singing to me, serenading me, talking to me. Let go. Let go of judgment. Now, Jesus said that 2,000 years ago. He said, judge not, lest ye be judged. I think probably uh, those are probably the two most succinct words, when you put them together, what Jesus taught. You could, you could say his entire teachings on planet Earth could be boiled down to judge not. That's, that's it. And I think experientially we all can relate to that because we do know intuitively that the only difficulty we ever face is when we're judging would be nice to be in that pristine state of mind of just beholding the glory and the perfection of, of God and being totally in the present moment with no concerns or regrets about the past and no worries or concerns or plans for the future. The other thing, some of you might have heard of the Gospel of Thomas. May have heard of the Gospel of Thomas, but the, there's another two-word teaching from Jesus in the Gospel of Thomas, and it's very, very famous. And it's it's be passers-by. Be passers-by. And I looked around the course to see if I could find anything in the course, and and basically I found it in lesson workbook lesson 128. Jesus says, the only value that this world holds for you, and when Jesus starts a sentence with, the only value that this world holds for you, doesn't it get our attention? Don't you want to know how he's going to finish the sentence? When he starts the, the sentence with, the only value the world holds for you, and then he finishes the sentence, is that you pass it by. Oh, be passers-by, judge not. So, there's even a section in the Course called, I Need Do Nothing. And Jesus talks about meditation, and he 
talks about fighting against sin, and he talks about uh, contemplation. He, he says these means have, will, will succeed and have served others, but your way will be different. A holy relationship is given you. So he's giving a method in A Course of Miracles that will actually save time. He said, yes, meditation, that will work. Contemplation, good, good. <laughs> Fighting against sin, tough one, but it, it could succeed <laughs> if you want to try it. He says, your way will be different. A holy relationship is given you as a means of saving time, as a means of collapsing the Alpha and the Omega, as a means of coming to the present moment, which is what all spirituality is, coming to the present moment. And and even there, he's saying, if you would do one thing for me to show your allegiance, allegiance do this one thing, but, but mean it, mean it, be sincere. Say and really mean, I need to do nothing. That, of course, with what we've been conditioned from the past, can at times seem the most absurd thing. I need to do nothing. <laughs> Because our identity, our self-concept, our image is tied into being the doer. The body is not just a puppet in our experience on the string, but it is an identity. It has taken the place of our spiritual reality as the I am presence. And what Jesus is saying is, well, you need to make a, a quiet place in your mind in which the activities of the body cease to demand your attention. That's the ultimate aim of meditation. That's the ultimate aim of be still and know that I am God. But the Course is saying that if you are able to tune into guidance, you will be done through. In other words, the spirit will, will use the puppet in a very purposeful way. The spirit will speak through the puppet, smile through the puppet, laugh through the puppet, hug through the puppet, bring happiness and joy. It will be an instrument, like St. Francis's prayer, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. And that alignment, where you basically are giving up the control of the puppet, you're giving up the ambitions that you placed on the puppet. You're giving up your hopes for a future for the puppet. You're, you're giving up the desire to, to literally control the puppet, and you're literally saying, it's yours. That was my experience that I had back around 1986 when the Course in Miracles first came into my life out here in, in Southern California. It's actually down in La Jolla, a little bit south of here, was when the Course first came to me, I could feel that the purpose of the book was to help me let go of the identity that I had held for years, had built for years, the self-concept that I had invested in was egoic. So, so to me, this is a course that is so, so direct at letting go of the false identity to experience the truth of, of what spirit is. Many traditions say that the present moment is, is the gateway to eternity, and Jesus says that in the course. He says, the past is gone, the future is but imagined, these concerns are but defenses against present change of focus. So you can see true spirituality is really having the prayer of your heart to simply be fully present. To the ego, the ego says, that's ridiculous, that's, that's unattainable. But Jesus repeats over and over in the Course, he says, for example, he says, at no single instant does the body exist at all. It is always remembered or anticipated. So you can hear he's saying the same thing in many different ways. 
He's just saying, if you're willing to truly let go of all investment in the body, then you will find the joy of God. You will find the peace of God. You will find that you, you have no cares, no concerns, no worries. He, he calls us and he says that, that, can you imagine what it's like to have no cares, no worries, and no concerns, and to be completely quiet all the time? That is what time is for, to learn just that and nothing more. You see, he's saying it over and over and over to be present. Now, sometimes people will say, well, I would love, like the, like the Jerry Jampolsky book, Love is Letting Go of Fear, I would like to let go of fear. And Jesus is saying that because the ego is fear, because the ego is a death wish, that those that seem to come to time and space, whether they're conscious of it or not, are death worshippers. So that's uh, a pretty strong, <laughs> pretty strong teaching. Uh, most of us think of ourselves in many different ways, but maybe death worshiper is not <laughs> the thing that we, we have on our list. What Jesus though is saying, he says things that no pathway ever in history has ever said, even non-dual pathways. The world was made as an attack on God, a place where God can enter not. That's from the workbook. Uh, wow. That's, the world was made as an attack on God. He's like, no problem. It was answered by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> and the Holy Spirit is the spirit of joy. And so everything I'm going to teach you is going to teach you to tune in to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a reminder that you're the Christ. The Holy Spirit is a reminder that you could never, ever truly sin. You can never, ever truly separate yourself from God. Because God's will is for perfect happiness. So there's no room in God's will for error. There's no room in God's will for doubt. There's no room in God's will for, for separation. And in the Course, we're offered what he calls the atonement. The sole responsibility of the teacher of God or the miracle worker is to accept the atonement. That's the correction. Uh, he tells us you're not responsible for the error. You are responsible for accepting the correction. And then he goes one more step to say, that's your only responsibility. Now, for me, that, that is a very strong and deep teaching because when you hear Jesus say that it's your sole responsibility, and he means S-O-L-E, only, soul, only, one responsibility. That's important because that responsibility has no guilt with it. And anything else you accept in your mind, responsibility for, responsibility for the body, responsibility for children, responsibility for your, your front yard <laughs> getting mowed, your, responsibility, you know, anything that you experience in this world where you project that responsibility to something of time and space is where the guilt is being generated. You see how it works. One responsibility takes you into innocence, the awareness of innocence, and the other takes you into holding on to guilt. So what we would consider reincarnation is still an attempt to hold on to, to guilt. And, and we're told, even in the disappearance of the universe, that, that no one returns to Earth without, without guilt. Uh, guilt like draws you back, draws you into karma, draws you into 
pain draws you into time, draws you into repetition. So, so this, this is, to me, this has been such a practical, helpful course because it's basically said your function and your happiness are the same. Your function will set your mind free. Your function is forgiveness and nothing else. And, and then it's a matter of, of simply saying, let me test that out. <laughs> let, me, let me try that out and see if that, that really works. And the good news is, is that it does. It does work. It, it takes your mind into that state of like being lifted up and carried above uh, concerns, worries, the things of the world. It's not that you don't have to face anything, but it's that you experience that you are not ever facing anything alone. You know, that feeling of, of heaviness, like it's on my shoulders, you know, like, oh my God, this falls to me, or I'm expected to carry this, or I'm expected to be the one who, who makes it happen. I'm the go-to person or whatever. We're very familiar with those things and, and what it's shown to me, like even coming out to here to LA, we, we hopped on the plane, we flew here, we came down, we came to the luggage rack and then uh, there were the two, <laughs> our two friends <laughs> there and it said, What's your name? Senta. Senta. We had a big discussion about that name. Mm -hmm. Darren and Senta were there at the very same moment <laughs> that we arrived. And it was beautiful. That we, uh, we had those kind of things happening all the time of, of meeting, arriving tonight even. We were going to meet at a restaurant <laughs> and we got there at the very same moment. Those kind of little synchronicities, those kind of things are, are kind of like the humor of the universe, the humor of the spirit saying, oh, look at this, and then look at this, and then look at this. And that's what I mean by miracles are involuntary. You don't have conscious control. You don't have to figure it out. You don't have to plan it. You don't have to think, what am I going to do to make this happen? That's the biggest issue for Course, course in Miracles students is this still this belief that I have to do something consciously to, to bring about the miracle. And, and actually we don't. We just have to desire it. We just have to pray for it. We're used to words too. I mean, the Course is, is 31 chapters, 365 lessons, and a manual for teachers. But actually, what it is, is it's a book that's saying, prayer is the medium of miracles. Your prayer is so powerful. What you pray for is how you draw God into your awareness. We had lunch with Jennifer today and she was she was so excited was telling her practice. You know, I listened to this, I listened to this section from the course from you, David, and then the workbook lesson, and then I do this, and I do this, and this, and this, but it was with joy. This is my practice. This is my daily practice. And when your daily practice is joyful, you're more likely to put your heart and soul in it. If you have a thought like, uh, uh, <laughs> what have I got to do <laughs> today? You know, if it, if it turns into a task, if it turns into something on the timeline, you know, okay, I've got to fit it into my schedule today. If it, if it turns into something that you feel you're personally responsible for and that you literally have to personally do something 
to make it happen, you have to personally effort, then there's going to be a bit of resistance. Uh, I would say it would be reluctant. Wouldn't you be reluctant if, if, you, if part of your mind was going, get it over with? <laughs> you know? But if, if you feel the joy of your devotion to God, if you feel the joy when you do your course workbook lesson or you, you do your meditation or you do your prayers and you feel the joy just bubbling up in your heart, then that is going to be everything that will make the practice what it is. And eventually, you know, you can feel from this teaching, miracles are involuntary, that, that you might say, as your practice becomes more and more devoted, and more and more joyful, and more and more happy, then what seems to be, even the effort falls away, because miracles are natural. When they do not occur, something has gone wrong. <laughs> Isn't it nice to start to think that miracles are natural? You go gliding through the day. You feel like Fred Astaire and Ginger Roger, like you're dancing through the day, you know, and you're having fun, and then you think, wow, this, I think this is the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> it's actually supposed to be happy. It's supposed to be light. It's supposed to be joyful. I have that. Sometimes I'll be just meditating and I'll see the, the puppet of David just kind of dancing like Fred Astaire <laughs> in my mind with a, with a bubbly kind of sense of joy, like, ah, oh, yes, that's it. It's a dance. It's a dance. We have love in our heart. We have joy in our heart. It's a dance. It's a dance. It's a dance. And then there are no problems. Do you have a song that could capture that spirit? <laughs> I could sing Journey Home. The Journey Home. Okay, that's good. Wake me 
Marjorie, let there be light. <laughs> She's like, I can do that. <laughs> yeah. Well, I think for all of us, you know, the practicality is, is like, wouldn't it be great to laugh more frequently? Wouldn't it be great where you just didn't have to laugh at jokes, but you started to feel the cosmic humor in everything, the gentle cosmic humor, the gentle laughter of the spirit, nothing 
is really the matter. You are safe. You are home. You can start to see the humor in the tiniest, tiniest little things. And, and that, your life becomes more comical, uh, like Dante called it, the divine comedy. But, but it's, not a, it's not a comedy that involves putting anything down. It's, it's a comedy that just is so light, that just allows everything to be exactly as it is, without any desire to change it. For me, that has been the most important thing, is that, that when you devote your life to spirit, God, whatever you want to call it, to your intuition, the, the immediate effect of that decision is a lightness. You start to feel a lightness. You, st you feel you're not carrying a burden anymore when you give your life over. Uh, we've had Judy Sketch, my friend Judy Sketch Wishon, who was the publisher of the course, she passed away, it was last year, when my mother passed away too, and we had Jerry Jampolsky passed away, Olivia Newton John. Jerry Jampolsky, he loved the course. Here was a psychiatrist who got so led up with A Course in Miracles, and, and Jerry, I think Jerry's favorite line from the Course was this, the peace of God is my one goal, the aim of all my living here, the end I seek, my purpose and my function and my life, while I abide where I am not at home. Wow, that's pretty single-minded. My purpose, my function, my life. What a teaching that says, if you focus your mind on your purpose with the Holy Spirit, everything will click in. I remember the first time I read the setting the goal section in the course where Jesus said, if you set the goal out front, if you put the goal first and you set it out front, and you will perceive everything and everyone in each situation as, as working together for the good, as, as actually all supporting that purpose. But with the ego, we're not used to putting that purpose in front. We have too much past learning. We already decide, what do I want to come of this situation? So Jesus repeats it again in the Rules for Decision the end of the, his text, he's basically saying, your one remaining problem is that you decide first what you want to come of a situation, and then you ask. That's your one remaining problem. You decide first what you want to come of a situation. We know how that works habitually. If you have children, what do I want to come of this situation with my daughters or with my children? What do I want to come of this work situation? Maybe you're a sports fan. What do I want to come of this California Angels game that's playing tonight? <laughs> we, we were sitting at the, at the restaurant before we came here and, and they, there's a baseball game going on. Slava knows nothing about American football, American baseball. I said, no, it's the, it's the California Angels. And Mike Trout is coming up to bat. I said, oh, he's the, he's the franchise. So as soon as I said he's the franchise, boom, he hits a home run right on the spot as soon as I said he's the franchise. But it's like everything we perceive is exactly as we wish it to be. It's, it's hard to believe at first that your mind could be that powerful, but Jesus is saying that everything that happens to me I ask for and receive as I have asked. Uh, there's a part uh, in, in the workbook where he says, um, what happens is what I desire, and what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. That's a little bit like Ramana Maharshi, <laughs> you know, what he used to teach. What happens is what I desire, and what 
what does not occur is what I do not want to happen. He's basically saying our mind that nothing, not just in our personal lives, but nothing in the entire cosmos happens without our desire. And then what Jerry Jampolsky, his favorite quote was, the peace of God is my one goal. Do you want the peace of God more than you want outcomes? You know, Marianne Williamson said early on with the Course, she said, do I want the peace of God or do I want him to call? <laughs> Meaning like in a date, do I want him to call back or do I want the peace of God? That's, that's the question, always the question, do I want the peace of God? And then what I've discovered is, well, start to put my mind into that, but the more I put my mind into this peace of God, into this purpose, uh, then the more I just held everything as working out very synchronistically, very serendipitously, very much without effort, uh, -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum -ba -dum, like a Fred Astaire, Ginger Roger dance, da -da 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 -da. you know, it's a happy dance when you don't have any uh, outcomes in mind. Everything is taken care of. Jesus says, once you accept his plan as the one function you would fulfill, there will be nothing else the Holy Spirit will not arrange for you without your effort. What? Without my effort? You see, it's a very, 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 very high teaching, but it's only experienced by the practical application, by the devotion to it. You devote yourself to it and you receive the, the blessings and the benefit from, from it. All that I give, I give to myself. It just, it's just very good. Now, practically speaking, I remember I was raised in, a, in kind of a sports family and of course I was raised, you know, that's what all education was, you know, your job, your career, and everything. I do remember, I popped a book open in the early years, back in the 1980s, and I remember reading the line where Jesus said, never underestimate the need to be vigilant against, it's got my attention when Jesus says that, never underestimate the need to be vigilant against the idea of competition. But this whole world is based on competition. The economic system is based on competition. The sports are based on competition. The political system is based on competition. The fabric underneath this entire world of time and space is based on the belief in competition. And what do you need to have competition? You have to have opposites. You have to have two. There could not be competition in one. And so you can just imagine, you know, when the in the parable of David, when you're 28 years old, you're supposed to be well underway into your curriculum of com competition by 20, 28 years old. Yours, what is the purpose of an education if it's not to help you to compete in the marketplace? What is the purpose of, of learning if it's not to learn to compete? And if we look at nature, you know, Marlon Perkins and all the survival, remember those, those things? It's the kill or be killed world. The animal kingdom is in competition. The, there's a competition in so many different levels and so many different realms. And then Jesus comes along and I have to say that hit me hard. I think I was in my 20s, but I read Never underestimate the need to be vigilant against competition. Now, that was helpful for me, but I actually was more like, okay, I'll do that, but actually, what do you want me to focus on? Because 
if I'm not, if I'm going to be so vigilant against the idea of competition, I have a feeling you're going to unwind me from career, from job, from family, from everything that this world is about, if we're going in that direction. And, and Jesus was just saying, yeah, I, you remember your soul functions to be a miracle worker. I will perform miracles through you, but you have to be willing for me to use your, your mind and your body to do that. And what a magical 30 some years it's been in that mode, because the, the doors open up, the, the blinders come peeling off your eyes. You start to be able to look in, at the world in a new way that like you've never seen it before, like you're seeing it for the very first time, like our cat, who every day is going around sniffing every single thing in the house. Like she's never seen it or smelled it before. It's a great symbol, you know, when this cat comes out and it comes up to your your foot and starts sniffing your toe again for the every single day. What this is the kind of symbols the Holy Spirit is sending in. So preciously innocent. So symbolic of, of no past. <laughs> Always the sniff. Everything gets the sniff test. You pack the luggage. Oh, that's an inspector coming in for that. You know, got to get in and sniff every, every bit of it. It's actually delightful when you, when you see a critter like this, a creature like this, that is so clueless that you start to think, wow, could I be that clueless? And if I was that clueless, would I be safe? You know, in a world of defenses, would I be safe to be that clueless? Remember what Jesus said in the Bible, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. And of course, in my defenselessness, my safety lies. So to me, that's been what an adventure. I've had people, there was some times where I was just like, is this going to work, Jesus? You know, somebody threatening, threatening something. You ever get a threatening letter in the mail or a threatening email or something or a threatening voicemail? And then you go, whoop. And then Jesus says, give it to me. Give it to me. Let me take that. Let me take that perception of a threat. You just pray and give it to me, and that's it. But, but how, how am I supposed to defend myself? You're not. You're not. But is that practical? You're not to defend yourself. Give it to me. Even when, in the period of A Course in Miracles, there they got into a legal struggle over the ownership of A Course in Miracles. I remember I was traveling around and, and there was a, I heard there's a lawsuit. There's an actual lawsuit with, with attorneys and defense attorneys and sides and all this and this. And then I heard there's two lawsuits and then there's three lawsuits and then four or five. There was at one point, I think I was traveling and they were telling me there's actually six live current lawsuits running about the ownership of the words in the Course in Miracles. And then people, I was giving talks and people were saying, which side is right? And I was like, which book are you reading? What do you mean, which side is right? Does Jesus ever, ever once in the Course in Miracles say you should take a side? Not once, not once. Be defenseless. Be completely defenseless. Be meek. He even explains what he meant in the Bible, the meek shall inherit the earth. He says it, they will literally overtake the perception of the earth with their strength. If we don't judge, our mind is so strong because our mind is as God created it. It's a, it's a beholder of love. It beholds love in everything it looks upon. 
when we don't judge. And when we judge, we mete out that judgment on our own mind. We, we just take it upon ourselves. So for me, the most practical thing is, I, I did say to Jesus, you know, I said, well, that's a pretty tall order to, not to judge. And he said, well, why don't you then let the Holy Spirit go before you and judge for you? Why don't you listen to the Holy Spirit who will judge for you? If you have a decision to make, he will tell you what to do. If you have a concern or you have to make a decision, he will make the decision with you. And it will bring joy to your mind and to everyone. So to me, that was the strongest pull to listen and follow the Holy Spirit. It was tempting, I, I mean, you know, raised with parents and a sister and, and 10 years of university, it was tempting. It was tempting to fall back on past learning and think occasionally like, well, I think I have a plan here. I think I know what's going on here in this situation. And then Jesus would remind me again, don't you remember that part in the early lessons of the course? I told you, in no situation do you perceive your, best, your own best interests. Not in some. In not a single situation do you ever perceive your best interest. And then, if you are open to that, then you will be shown what, what your best interest is, which is the Holy Spirit's perspective. But in no situation do you perceive your own best interest. That wants to draw me more to watch that cat and the cluelessness of that cat sniffing everything as if it doesn't know what it is with a curious nose. I do sometimes call her the nose. It's <laughs> my dick nickname. Here comes the nose. Because the nose is like first time. It's this. And, and yet, she does live a, a graceful life. Clueless and graceful. Clueless, carefree, and careful. Yeah, yeah. I gave a talk at our Course in Miracles Monastery one time, and I, those are the three words that came out. Clueless, carefree, and cared for. And my friend at the time, Lila, her eyes just got real big. And I think the first time she heard those three words, she just took that as her motto. And she's passed away now. But she became so joyful, living clueless and carefree and cared for. She had to let go of a lot. She was, she was in the corporate world when I first met her. And she had to <laughs> drop out like St. Francis, <laughs> uh, slowly unwind, unwind into that state of mind of grace, just the grace of God. Well, I actually, I put this chair up here because we have one mic here, wireless mic, and I thought, I love practicalities. If anybody wants to come up and and share anything, or ask a question, ask a question or dive into something. Because for me, it's all about the practicality of it. And that's the greatest joy for me is the practicality. So in this world, that, that can be kind of fun to, uh, to kind of explore something together. That's what I grew up watching videos of like uh, J. Krishnamurti exploring a topic and I felt so much joy in my heart watching him explore a topic because he was basically a letting go of what was believed to be real and important and then kind of going down into an experience of uh, just joyful acceptance. So if anybody wants to come I thought I'd put a chair because it's easy for me to pass. Quick one. Quick yes, question. Carl. I've often read in the course that 
um, we are to love everyone and everything. And I'm wondering, I could see loving everyone, that means all the spirits here, but does that include whales, cockroaches, uh, rattlesnakes, all living things? The question is, what does the Course mean by all living things? Very good. That's a good question. What? Because I know that is in the workbook. All living things. He does come with those exact words. Well, the, what I came to was he, uh, Jesus referred me to workbook lesson 29 and workbook lesson 30. God is in everything I see, which is 29. I'm sorry. That would work pretty well with all the other things. God is in everything I see. And then lesson 30, because God is in my mind. So, is Jesus trying to teach us that God is in the rattlesnakes and the cockroaches and the whales and the giraffes and ants and everything else? No, in philosophy we would call that pantheism, that God indwells in objects. God is in the chair. So when Jesus is doing these two lessons, 29 and 30, God is in everything I see because God is in my mind, which is lesson number 30. He's explaining himself. He's basically saying that the Holy Spirit, remember the Holy Spirit is God's representative for a mind that's asleep and is forgotten, eternal love. The Holy Spirit is the bridge back. So we could say what two ways we could interpret lesson 29 and lesson 30 is the Holy Spirit is in everything I see because the Holy Spirit is in my mind. The Holy Spirit is the perspective I was talking about earlier that simply sees the false as false. What is true is what God creates. God creates the eternal. Are rattlesnakes eternal? No. Are, uh, you know, ants or any... Bodies, are they eternal? Of course not. Yeah. Anything. So God is the creator of eternity and God creates like himself. So for example, you know, even in this world we get we get apples from apple trees, we get pears from pear trees, we get oranges from orange trees, and we say the fruit comes from the the vine, or the, if it's a grape, the vine, the, the branch, or whatever. And and what Course is teaching is that God is an eternal being. God has no beginning and no end. God is eternity. And that Christ is an eternal creation. And that that Christ even has eternal creations and that our creations are waiting for us to wake up so we can remember them. Because while we are identified with bodies, we've forgotten our creations. <laughs> Christ even has creations. But they're all spirit. They're all They're perfectly spirit. They're not form. There's even a line in the Beyond All Idols section where Jesus says, God knows not form. Now, we're going back to lessons 29 and 30. If God is in everything I see because God is in my mind, then the Holy Spirit is in everything I see because the Holy Spirit is in my mind. It must be that there's a way that the Holy Spirit sees that is real, that is real. It doesn't have these dense vibrations that we call bodies. Because we all know, even in quantum physics, that everything's energy, right? But there's some energy that's vibrating at slower, denser rates, and we call that the physical world, even though God didn't create those slower, denser, <laughs> you know, those denser vibrations. God's not like, oh, I think I'm going to create some dense vibrations, you know. God, God is love and light, and God just creates like God. So, so basically, when he says we're to love all living things, he's basically calling us to the vision of Christ, and he's calling us to the Holy Spirit's perspective, where he's just saying, you just have to 
first of all forgive and he also says God does not forgive for God is never condemned so God, forgiveness doesn't have anything to do with God but it does have everything to do with the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit is the comforter he's the bridge he's the one that's going to help us and you could say that this vision is is the whole point of A Course in Miracles. And for me, it's one thing where people say, okay, I'm trying to follow this, Jesus, but I can't wrap my head around it. And Jesus is saying, I don't want you to wrap your head around this, because this is not something that involves your head, <laughs> or your past learning, or your intelligence. This is something that involves prayer. Prayer is the meeting of miracles. So in my experience. I remember I took the course to the woods of Kentucky and I was just praying and praying and I left everything behind. I'm just down there praying and praying and praying all day and night, praying and praying and praying. And then at one point I, I kept praying so much that I was a bit shocked and surprised that I had a revelatory experience where the three-dimensional world just all of a sudden looked, didn't look three-dimensional, it started to collapse like into two-dimensionality and then it was gone. I went into the direct contact with, with God, with the light. And that was a very powerful experience because there was nothing, anything in earth, on earth that I had that was anything like it. It was like, it was like a direct contact with God. And then I just kept praying and praying and praying and praying and praying. And it happened the second time, and then it happened the third time, and and I could say that was very convincing. Uh, you can only imagine, I guess you can't really imagine, but if you can only feel what the experience was like because the world was gone. It was the disappearance of the universe that uh, Gary, Arden and Persa talk about. But, but to me, that showed me that there was a light that was not of the five senses, that was beyond, like the world was a veil, and the veil was, was split, and then it disappeared. It literally seemed like that while I was doing, I was doing open-eyed, eye-gazing uh, meditation with a woman three different times where we were just sinking deeper and deeper into the stillness and then her figure, the figure ground of her and the background collapsed and then the light just streamed through and then the world disappeared. So, so when Jesus is saying we have to love every living thing, he's not actually speaking of perception because perception of the five senses is literally the veil of fragmentation. It's, the, it's like the veil, did anybody see the Matrix? When Neo first goes to meet Morpheus, Morpheus says the world was, has, has been pulled over your eyes to blind you from the truth. And then Neo is like, what is the truth? And basically Morpheus is teaching him that the Matrix is real. He's teaching what the, the Course is teaching in Lesson 152. There, no, one, 133, he's teaching, 132, 132, there is no world. He's, he comes in one sentence, there is no world. Now, this is not so different now, from now we're looking at quantum physics because Quantum physicists have said the same thing that Jesus is saying, is there is no world. It's, it's all energy. And what we perceive as the cosmos, time and space, is just dense, dense energy. In, in India they call it maya. They call it maya, which is another word for illusion. So, so it is a metaphor. When he says all living things, he's not making a category. He's not saying that snakes and, and elephants and giraffes are more living than rocks or rivers, you see. There's no hierarchy of illusion. All his first principle is there's no order of difficulty in miracles, and then later on he, 
he restates that and so there is no hierarchy of illusions. What an adventure we're on. Can you imagine that there's no order of difficulty in miracles, that Jesus could raise the dead, pull Lazarus out of a, out of a crypt and say, come forth, and Lazarus comes in with these stinky grave clothes on, and you can only imagine what Mary and Martha thought when their brother, who was dead for, the Bible says three days, but I think in the Rancher book it says four days. Four days, stinky grave clothes, and then Jesus comes along and the first thing he says to Mary and Martha in the Bible is, is they're crying and weeping, Lord, if you'd just been here just a few days sooner, our brother would not have perished. And then Jesus says, this one is not to the death. What is he talking about? This one is not to the death, and then Lazarus come forth. So that is a dramatic miracle in the Bible. Literally, there's no order of difficulty in miracles. So there was no levels of sickness. Some people will say, David, what is the worst sickness that you've ever come across? And I said, well, death. <laughs> Lazarus was by any medical definition, that's a bad case. He's, he's been dead for four days, and he stinks, the body stinks. Now that is sick, Even by any definition, any nurse or doctor. Oh yeah, that's, that's very, very bad, dead for four days. And yet, come forth. So what Jesus is saying is, now I want you to practice this in your daily life. I want you to just pray and ask the Holy Spirit what to say and what to do so that you can be taken back, 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 in your mind to a point where you realize that love is real. Remember that Carol King song, Only Love is Real? Does anybody remember that? Only love is real, everything else illusion, adding to the confusion, the way we connive at being alive, chasing, of, say, chasing an end till we can sign the thing that allows us to feel only love is real. Wow, that's, Carol King is teaching what the Course is teaching in that song, Only Love is Real. And something in us resonates with that. We, something in us knows absolutely that's true, that love, only love is real. And, and yet, the mesmerism, Mary Baker Eddy talks about, the, all the, the trickery of the ego, ingenious, that, fooling the mind that into these these things. Specialness. This one is more important than that one. That this thing is more important than another. Even that that we can tell the difference between birth and death, or that we can tell the difference between dead and living. I what's the movie Solaris? At the very end of the movie, the, the wife returns again for the third time only to tell the psychi psychologist, played by George Clooney, when he says, am I dead or am I alive? Her answer is, we don't have to think like that anymore. That's quantum. <laughs> when your wife returns three times <laughs> and tells you, we don't have to think like that anymore, that's Jesus. That's, she's rep representing Jesus Christ saying, you are an eternal being, you have eternal life, and nothing can keep you from remembering that. It's inevitable that you'll wake up and remember the way that God created you. So that's, that's like a long answer to <laughs> about the living things, but he's, he's, just using a, he's just using kind of a metaphor. Yeah, so take us, take us back into the light. Thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. Anybody else? Carl didn't come up here, but he asked it from back. <laughs> we got one over here. We got one. Two. Yes. Um, well, you made a couple of references there to the Matrix and Solaris. Um, could you, uh, just in a nutshell, explain uh, the idea behind the mindful movie watching that made reference to it in the, in the book over there about? Yeah. Yeah, I think I mentioned earlier how I was saying 
to Jesus, am I going to have to invent parables? And he was like, no, no, no. In fact, there came a point, I loved movies so much, and then Jesus would be praying, praying, praying. He would say, let's go to the movie theater or let's rent something at Blockbuster back when there was a Blockbuster. And, and he would like start giving me commentary while I was watching the movie. And he was like giving me instructions and commentary, which wasn't new because in the early years, like in 19, like 1990, I went to spend time with Ken and Gloria Wapnick, and then I was back there a few times, 1990, 1991. And when I would be listening to Ken, Jesus was giving me commentary in my mind to what Ken was teaching. He was pointing things out. Pay attention here, look at this, look at this. I don't get it, here's some examples, ba, 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 ba. you know. Like you, almost like you had like a life coach, an eternal life coach in your mind. <laughs> so that was like, and here's the commentary. So for me, when I started watching Star Trek and started watching movies and everything, I thought, wow, these movies are kind of like Hollywood movies and movies from India. Bollywood. I said, these are like parables. And he said, exactly. These are teaching devices. And I can use them to give you instruction while you're watching the movie. So that's what the Movie Watcher's Guide to Enlightenment is. It, it gives, like, like, maybe you're dealing with a certain issue and then you kind of go through it. Or online, you can even do, use the index. Like you, you say, I'm feeling guilty or I'm feeling doubtful or feeling like uh, my issue is infidelity or my issue is um, lack or whatever. And then it cross-references movies that help help you move through that stuck point with that. You may be stuck in a major issue and then it helps you locate the movies. And then I started doing them online. So like right now I'm in the middle of showing a, a Turkish series. I've never watched a Turkish movie in my entire life or a Turkish uh, sitcom or soap opera, but Jesus brought in this one movie called Doom of Love and it was an amazing teaching device that went all the way to transcendence. Um, it went all the way to the real world in the movie where one of the main characters appeared to two other characters even though he had died. It was, it was like a, in one sense, like a resurrection scene of transformed awareness. And then this other one I've been showing, I've been showing a couple episodes uh, online. And, and I love how practical these teaching devices are. We'll go the week and then sometimes, sometimes as early as Monday or Tuesday, but we, we are just shown the movie that we're to, to show. And, so that's another way we can keep it practical. People write in their themes or they vote on the things that they're dealing with the most, things that they're struggling with the most, and then we pray and then Jesus gives us the movie or the episode and the commentary. He sets it up through me and then he gives commentary all the way through. So it's a very fast way of, um, of, of coming free of these, uh, these dark thoughts and beliefs, you know, it's kind of a quick way. And people have felt that, I, like Rich, you know, with Ramana Maharshi, people would just go and, and sit in the cave or in the presence, and then things that seemed to be difficulties before they went there would just start vanishing from their mind, because minds are joined, and the, the light was so bright that, that the darkness couldn't couldn't hang on. It literally just starts to, to fall away. So that's how you know, I use uh, movies and those kind of things a lot. They're very, very joyful. I'm going to follow your instructions. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Here you got uh, David. <laughs> yeah, I, I met you about seven years ago. And I Twins. Don't remember over there, over near Venice Beach, and I asked you about thirty questions. Um, the course for me, I've been studying about twenty years, 
And my big takeaway, and, and it's been like this for about five years, is that we're all connected. He created, uh, God created this sonship, he calls it. All our minds are connected. Uh, I studied networking in college, and I think of it as uh, like my phone or my PC has a network card, and that I have these downloads. He talks about in like the first page, you know, the, uh, vertical downloads, and that he helps me with the downloads. And I like your your puppet example, really um, ring my chimes. That I want these downloads. I want to I want to empty it, my my mind, uh, my brain, whatever. Any obstacles, hindrances. Get these downloads, and, and that's what I was created for. That's uh, it, it, in the course. One of the things I pick up on that a lot of people don't pick up on is the word "what." What am I? You know, the question is, what am I? Not who am I? Who am I? I believe is what I what I made up. What am I is what he created me connected with everyone. So the whole idea of oneness that we're all one. I've heard people talk about uh, something like if there's 8 billion people and, they're, and it's all like, think of them as 8 billion brain cells that make up one brain, that we're all connected. Uh, when I studied networking, all the, all the, we're all like T-8000 Cisco routers we receive. And right now I'm transmitting to 30 people, okay? Um, <clears throat> Bluetooth. It's like there's this connected, we're all connected. And we're all communicating all the time with energy and everything. So this is what he made, and I believe that I have this life. He's, in, in the course, I, I picked up on a line that says, oh, life is a gift. And when I sit in course meetings, when I read the course, you know, I have this life. He created me with these eight billion other people having this really funky experience. It's, and then, um, in the way of mastery, he talks about to be a spiritual being is boring. To be here is a very fascinating experience. Jesus wrote. Um, it's the end of the mind. Uh, Jesus channeled through the um, in, in the way in the way of mastery. He he says, uh, "I want to be in a physical experience. More, it's more, it's more rich an experience than being just a spirit." So I'm here having this life. I've got a kid, I've got a wife, I've got, you know, I, I have a very good life um, in, in the way of Master he says, like, think about what your experience here, what level of experience you want to have, and then you can kind of make it manifest. And I have, you talked a little bit about it today, you know, you go through and you're dancing through your days. It's helped me do all that in this life. When I sit in course meetings, people are, it's all a dream, it's not real, and I'm like, well, there is a life, it is a gift. I, I, I want to hear someone like you talk about the difference between the dream and what is my life. What he created all of us together. He created something here. And, and, and I hear that minimized. I, that's what I hear. And, and, and I kind of appreciate my life. And I appreciate what he made. What he made. And, 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 and I'm trying to think in terms of I'm one with everybody. And, and that's what he's teaching me through the course. David, you're, you're one with everybody. There really is no David. There's, there's just everybody. And my, my problem when I have one is that I think that I'm this individual. Can you talk about that? Yeah, thanks. Thank you, David. Well, what I've come to experience is that when I asked Jesus, like, what is the, the function of the body? And Jesus said, the Holy Spirit only sees one function for the body, and that's communication. I thought, oh wow, Peter, that's amazing. You mean, out of all the invented functions for the body, we could talk about all the different jobs, and roles, and family roles, and, and romantic roles, and and on and on and on and on of all the seeming, we'll say, 
trillions and trillions of different purposes and meanings and roles and functions for the body. And Jesus says, no, no, it's much simpler than that. The body is only a communication device for the Holy Spirit. So then I was like, okay, then, then really knowing my, myself as light, as an eternal being, is equated with the holy instant. And then I start to look very closely at those holy instant passages. How does this communication relate to the holy instant? And Jesus basically said, if you would, would share and be in full communication with everyone and everything, then you must not have any private thoughts. I was like, that sounds really cool. You mean to tell me that this is all a communication function? We're getting close to our time. Darlene J Johnson, I have you have a cat outside waiting. <laughs> okay. Very good. See how practical we are? There's a cab outside. <laughs> Thank you, darling. Thank you for coming. But you see how I was like, okay, if he's teaching us the holy instant is where you go and completely join with, with your brothers, your sisters, and with God. And you do this by having no thoughts that you would keep private and hidden. I thought, that's Great, it's a communication solution. See how practical you say, I've got a wife, I've got kids and everything, and Jesus is like, yeah. So, I, I studied a lot of spirituality through history and, you know, St. Francis and Mother Teresa and the scenes and all of them, the apostles and on and on. And I remember with these mystical communities and these convents and monasteries, I remember they had to take vows. You know, remember the vows? You take vow to be a nun, you take a vow to be a monk. Poverty, chastity, and obedience. That was the vows you had to take. And Jesus said, well, poverty really doesn't mean poverty the way you think of poverty. It means non-possession. Oh, I can see that. If, if I can have a mind that's non-possessive, I could realize my oneness. And then chastity, he said, is purity of thought. And I thought, oh, that's good too. If I can be non-possessive and go for, Jesus taught that in the Bible, blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Remember that? He was, oh, that's what, the, that's what that's about. And obedience, what if that just is obedience to the Holy Spirit? To listen to one voice, to follow one voice, to just let the one voice of voice for God speak through me all through the day and speak to me and through me all through the day. You see, so that's where we came up, David, in, with a practical, when I said to Jesus, How, what's the most practical way for me to reach you, God, through my relationships? Because you're saying, that's what, you just want to be on the network. <laughs> that's a, you're, you're just saying, I want to be connected on the network. And he's just saying, if you have no thoughts that you would keep private and hidden, then you will know communion. You will know communion with the Creator, with the Source. So, in the most practical way, that's for me the way that you move into an awareness that you're dreaming a dream, is by not keeping secrets and not having anything be private. And you can see if you go all the way with that, wow, no private thoughts, and no, I call it no people pleasing, will transform all of your relationships. If you practice every day, no private thoughts and no people pleasing, watch how everything lights up. Isn't it the secrets that always get us in trouble? If you watch these formulas for the movie, you, at the beginning of the movie, usually the first 10 or 15 minutes of the movie sometimes, there's a secret. And then the whole movie <laughs> plays out around the secret. That's the formula of the movie. But if you, if, if that would have been openly just like, ah, here's, I'm, I'm going to let go of this. If you let go of the secret, then the drama disappears. The conflict disappears. 
if you can actually practice no private thoughts, no people pleasing with your daughter, with your husband, with your daily interactions with your children, with everyone, yeah, then give, give a uh, practical example of that. No well, private thoughts. Well, you know, in in business, for example, people would say maybe your boss might say, well, you know, you don't don't give away any of our trade secrets because that gives us a competitive edge and we are we can earn more money and win more contracts um, by these certain secrets or there can be certain things in relationships where people will say oh you don't you don't want to really tell your partner that because that could cost you the entire relationship in this world it's it seems customary to keep secrets and it's because the guilt that's generated in the mind comes from this belief that you can have private thoughts. God didn't actually create us to have private thoughts. Private thoughts are, are what make humans seem to be human, seem to be less than Christ. So yeah, it, to me it just goes like even this series I'm showing, I'm doing a lot of commentary. We watched an episode together, <laughs> you and I and Svaba. But you can start to see that, that all of the stress, all of the strain, all of the struggle, and all of the hiding and defensiveness comes from the belief in private thoughts. So to me, David, you were asking like, what's the most practical way that I can really fully realize that I'm on, I'm on this giant network is that actually only the thoughts of God can be shared and that's what Jesus came to teach. You know, how is that practical? I remember when I used to read the Bible and I was raised Christian and everything but the one thing I liked to read was I always was drawn to the New Testament and I was always drawn to the red letters because those were the letters that Jesus was speaking. And when I was reading the red letters, my heart was going like this. Ooh, ooh, ooh. Good, 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 good stuff, good stuff. Can I read more? I just loved reading the red letters. Now, the reason I, now I think I love the red letters so much was Jesus was speaking for God and for everyone. He never had to be concerned and and tone down his message for a person or for a rabbi or for the authorities. He didn't let anything stand in his way from speaking for the whole universe. He was, he had like a megaphone out for the whole universe. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Whoa, that's some kind of red letters, you know, and when we read them, we, we, have a joy in our heart. So Carl is giving me the time signal. We've, we've reached our time tonight. But what, what a blessing it has been. I hope some of the things I've shared have been good food for thought. And uh, yeah, we have a lot of stuff that we share online and everything. So if you want to maybe check out a movie or with us or check out some other, some previous movies or some some of the teachings. I hope you'll avail yourself. And Slava has how many albums? Three. Three different yeah. albums. Yeah. So, what are they called? And I just got to say one thing yeah. for me. The greatest part too for the course is connecting with other people and sharing and, and having those deeper connections that sometimes we don't always have with just anybody. You know? So, really great to meet all of you tonight. Thank you. Thank you all for coming. It's been a blessing.